In this video, I'm going to talk about some more narrative concepts to start to consider in your work. In particular, choices that you need to make about the narrator and their role in your story. Some tools to consider around temporality and the pacing of your story. And how to use showing and telling in your work to improve the story that you tell. So first of all, the narrator. Um, there's a distinction to be made in storytelling between the speaking subject and the subject of speech. So, for example, in the sentence, the actor said, the subject of a speech here is the actor. Let's say we've interviewed an actor for some sort of story that we're telling. In this case, the speaking subject, which is the narrator, is what's called effaced. They're not visible in the story. We're reporting what someone has said, um, but we're not actually talking about the fact that they said it to us or that we were involved in this story. So that's one editorial choice. An alternative editorial choice is to refer to the narrator in the third person. So you might use the phrase, the actor told the BBC that they had done something. In this case, we have a speaking subject, it's the BBC, but this isn't an individual, it's a brand, it's an organisation, it's a third party reference. We're talking about we, and sometimes the word we is used as well, like we understand or we go and find out. In that case, we're still talking about the brand rather than an individual. The final choice, of course, is to have the individual as a speaking subject. In this case, we're using the word I in the story and we have become part of the story. This might be used in a first person experience like I decided to spend the day a day in the life of a vet or I decided to go and speak to this actor and find out more. So this is an editorial choice to make and it's worth thinking about which choice you might make in your story and why it is. One obvious consideration is the genre you're working in. Some genres require or expect an effaced narrator. In others, a first person narrator is much more common and conventional. Temporality is another tool to consider in your storytelling toolkit. And this refers to whether your story runs um, in chronological order, whether it um, skips back and forth in time, or indeed goes backwards in time, like the story of a curious case of Benjamin Button. Other elements of temporality include speed. For example, we could tell a story about the events that took place over five years, but that story is not going to take five years to tell. We can um, spend a lot of time on the first year and very little time on the others. Conversely, we can take a period of time and slow it down. We can tell the story of one minute and spend five minutes telling the story of what happened in that one minute. So we can stretch things out, we can turn things into slow motion, we can also use hyperlapse to speed up things on screen, for example. So the role of temporality can be quite important in telling a story and creating movement for your audience. A good example of this is Game of Thrones and the last series of Game of Thrones and some of the adverse reaction it had from fans about it. Now what's notable about the reaction of fans to the last series of Game of Thrones is that the objections weren't necessarily to the events of the story or the characters but actually to the temporality of it. In other words the last series of Game of Thrones essentially went too fast for a lot of the audience and that's summed up in this um, image, this uh, viral image which kind of explains what the, what the temporality was like before George Martin left the team. Another dimension of temporality is the relationship between duration and pacing. I mentioned the example of a story where the events take place over five years. That's the duration of the story, the, the events in the story. But the length of the story could be five minutes, five hours, 30 seconds, 30 words, 10 characters. Um, and that relationship between the duration and the length is basically the pacing. A five-year story told in 30 characters is a very high-paced, fast-paced story. So again, consider that in your story. 
And then we've got present and past tense, which also relates to temporality. Are you going to talk about the events of a story in the past tense, or are you going to talk about them in the present? The advantage of the present tense is it can inject a certain dynamism into the story, but it also has disadvantages as well. It can be actively misleading. This is a good example, this particular sentence, of using the present tense in a story that's written after an interview has been conducted. But because it's talking about habit and routine, the writer is able to use says and drives rather than said or drove. They can talk in the present tense because this is something he does every day. Then we have mimesis and diegesis, the fancy words for showing and telling. And the broad principle that in storytelling, you should always try to show and not tell. And this uh, is obvious perhaps in fiction, but in factual storytelling, there are some interesting examples to draw your attention to. In particular, this one, one of my favourites, which is a, a report about a trial. Um, the generic consideration here is that the narrator needs to be outside of the story and not visible. Um, and they cannot give their judgment on the events that are taking place in the story. But what caught my eye in this story is this single sentence that stands alone uh, in the middle of the story after the, um, uh, the verdict was reached and the girls were sentenced. And there is this long paragraph about the younger girl's family waiting for her. And then a single sentence that stands alone saying, nobody was watching or waiting for the older girl. No commentary is added here. There's no point at which the um, writer of the article says, this girl, no one cares about her or her family doesn't support her. She doesn't need to tell you these things because that single description shows you those things. And that's much more effective and has much greater impact. Now, an interview is a good example of that tension between um, editorial decisions and the way that a story appears. Um, an interview is essentially, as in this description, wants readers to forget that it is an interpretation of a conversation. But as a factual storyteller, you must always remember that an interview is an interpretation of a conversation. You, as the as the storyteller, are making choices about which bits of that conversation to include. There will be very dull parts. You're not necessarily going to include the part where you ask if they mind if you take off your coat, for example. And the ordering of that interview might not be um, the best order that it can be in terms of a way that it was originally conducted. So you might decide in the telling of the story of that interview that you choose to put some elements of it at the beginning of a story that might have happened towards the end of the actual interview. So temporality and chronology may be changed in order to create an effective narrative structure. What's key, obviously, is that you don't misrepresent what was said in the process of doing that. But it's important to emphasise that you should be making choices about which ingredients to use and how to order them in order to engage an audience and um, in something which is important. If you want to know more about showing and not telling, there's a video in the slides for this um, talk, for this video, about showing and not telling in writing. But actually that principle of show, don't tell isn't necessarily always true. Um, sometimes you can use the switch between showing and telling to inject a certain amount of movement and pace into your story. One particularly good example of this is an episode of the podcast Reply All, um, which I recommend you listen to. It's actually in two different parts, and it's the story of the, um, the, the presenter trying to track down a, um, a phone bank, a, a, a phone room, where they are making um, scam phone calls. And it involves him travelling to India and trying to track down this um, room where the phone calls are made from. Now, what's interesting about this is that um, when he travels to India, he obviously records his travels and he records himself walking down the street in India and what he can see. So we have a certain amount of, of showing. Um, even though he's describing what he can see, we can hear the, 
the road and the atmosphere, we get a sense of being in that location. But in the editing of that podcast, what the producers actually decide to do is cut between that reality of um, the recording of him in India and him answering questions about it back in the studio. So in other words, it cuts between showing what happened in India and him telling what happened in India afterwards. So we're cutting back and forth in time and we're cutting back and forth between mimesis and diegesis. And that is quite effective in maintaining the audience's interest. If we only heard the tape of him in India, it might be, well, it probably would be less interesting and less engaging. So those are a number of different techniques that you can use as a storyteller. Um, first of all, consider who is the speaking subject in your story. And what is their role? Are they effaced, invisible in the story? Are they a third person narrator? Or are they in the first person? Secondly, think about temporality and pacing and other considerations around time. How do you cut between different periods to create movement or even tension in your story? And finally, consider the principle of show, don't tell. And sometimes the fact that we might stray from that principle in order to create movement or tension by switching between showing and telling. To practice some of these techniques, I'd recommend writing a story in a particular genre, picking that genre, an interview feature, for example, and write something in that genre. Before you do that, look at other examples within that genre and try to identify what conventions that they use. For example, the stand first or the use of colour. Read about industry practice as well. There'll be plenty of books about that particular genre and people who use it. And there'll be industry press that talks, that has interviews, for example, with people who create material in that genre. And as well as writing in that genre, blog about the process, what editorial decisions did you make and why, what reading or examples gave you ideas. And you can even consider how the story could be structured differently or experiment with those different editorial decisions. You can find readings on interviewing on Moodle. There's a folder with a number of different resources. Um, just pick at least one of those, have a read through it and use it to influence what you do.